Good evening. You are right on time for the Top Bulletin in town. This is what we have coming up for you tonight. Now, members of parliament have decided to summon the ministers of infrastructure, education, ICT and innovation, the minister of gender and family promotion to respond to issues raised by members of parliament during their outreach around the country in March 2022. Also tonight on Friday, Father Philip Dennis, a Belgian author, launched a book entitled The Genocide Against the Tutsi and the Rwandan Churches, highlighting the role of some of the leaders of religions and churches in the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. Thank you so much for choosing RTV News. I am Isabel Masozera with my colleague Sam Kalisa. All right, let's get to our top story today. We go to matters of leadership, beg your pardon. Now, members of parliament have decided to summon ministers of infrastructure, education, ICT and innovation, as well as minister of gender and family promotion to give explanations to the issues that have been raised to members by members of parliament during their outreach around the country. And this happened in March, 2022. Regarding infrastructure, MPs point out that there are issues including inadequate water distribution, especially in rural areas, damaged bridges and delayed construction of roads. MPs also noted that residents raised issues including poor telecommunication network and conflicts between families is evidently one of the hindrances of the country's development. I think we need to set up a consultative meeting with various agencies and stakeholders to discuss on the issue of families and find solutions to them. But first of all, I would like to thank the Minister of Gender and Family Promotion, who will appear here to explain about these issues. Some roads that were under construction are not finished yet, such as the Waseru Komo, Yitrumi Nyagatare, and other places like Rurindo District. What happened? In some cases, the Ministry of Education has to set policies, but the implementation is done by the Ministry of Local Government. I would like to suggest these ministries work together to solve issues so that we can achieve the desired goals. However, MPs commended the distribution of electricity and the construction of classrooms. Based on the report of MPs, a tour to different parts of the country, the Speaker of the Chamber of Deputies, Honorable Donatil Mukabarisa, noted that they have decided to summon leaders of various agencies and ministries to indicate strategies in place to solve these problems. We have decided to summon various ministers to give explanations to the plenary session, the problems you saw in road construction, bridges, electricity and more. MPs also called on the Ministries of Justice, the Ministry of National Unity and Civic Engagement and the Ministry of Finance and Economic Planning to present to the plenary session strategies to address the issues at stake, such as issues in the Asia Hazard program, integration of memorial sites and the role of local authorities in preventing conflicts in families. On Friday, Father Philippe Denis, a Belgian author, launched a book entitled The Genocide Against the Tutsi and the Rwandan Churches, highlighting the role of some of the leaders of religions and churches in the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi during the launch. Participants appreciated the work done by the author, but also pointed out that among errors made in this book included uh, false numbers of victims of the 1994 genocide that was perpetrated against the Tutsi. We now go to Olive Nettie for more. In the book that was publicly launched on Friday of the priest and writer Philippe Dennis, he focused mainly on the role of Catholic Church and the Presbyterian Church. In a study by this author, he focused on the parish of Crete Congo Nil in the western of Rwanda. One of the survivors, who is also a witness in the book, Mutoni Marie Jeanne, says that those who took refuge in the parish were assured of security but ended up being killed by the Inherahamni. We fled to the parish. They said that people who take refuge in churches can't be harmed. We went to our parish, which was led by Father Gabriel Mendro. After the death of Habia Arimana, Mendro came and made us enter the house and said that he has a gun and that he will protect us and that nobody will harm us. 
He promised us miracles. Usually, leaders used to carry out Umuganda activities on Saturday. And on that Saturday, when leaders were carrying out Umuganda, Inera Hamge called Imuza Mugambi also came. They killed so many people that day. And at that time, Father Gabriel Mendro has already left. He used to pick up a call, and after that call, he would leave us alone. And after his leave, Inera Hamge would come and kill people. The Belgian author, Father Philippe Dennis, points out that during the genocide, churches had the responsibility to protect the victims, but yet they failed publicly to oppose to the genocide. Second is to, the, to be too close to the government. And in, in this case, in Congonil, that was the mayor, that was a prefect in Kibuye, etc. But historically, this uh, strong alliance, partnership, link between church and state, which made that when the worst happened, the genocide happened, they didn't have the ability to distance themselves very clearly. And the third, of course, is the silence. Uh, in this case, but elsewhere, when the genocide happened, despite exceptions, despite act of great bravery, and I must insist, despite the fact that many Christians have actually helped Tutsi people to survive, the church as such has been silenced, and that remains, that remains. The Minister of National Unity and Civic Engagement, Dr. Jean Damasen Bizimana, notes that even though the author revealed remarkable arguments about the role of churches in the genocide against the Tutsi, there are errors in the book that need to be corrected. <laughs> In this book, there are some of the good things about it, where he managed to go deeper into documents of the Catholic Church in Rome and other places and in the family of Dominicans. But there are some of the things we criticized first. He admits that the genocide happened and was perpetrated against the Tutsi. About the number, he mentioned the wrong number which is usually said by deniers, that the victims were 800,000, according to the UN. We showed him that in 2000, the government of Rwanda conducted a research, and in 2004, it revealed the known names of people, their parents, their age, and where they used to live. Currently, the names we have have also increased under more than one million. Being a researcher and seeing such a fact and ignoring it is wrong. The Ministry of National Unity and Civic Engagement urges authors that write books about the history of the country to be truthful about what happened in the genocide against the Tutsi, as there are true facts and evidence that show the severity of the genocide. Olive Nete, RTV News. Thank you, Olive. Now, Rwanda has been chosen to head the association that brings together anti-corruption agencies of 18 countries that are part of the Commonwealth. Now, the mandate will last just one year, but this comes at the conclusion of the 12th Regional Conference of the Heads of Anti-Corruption Agencies in Commonwealth Africa that had been taking place here in Kigali. Sergeant Hore brings us this report. First off, as Rwanda, a country with good leadership that does not tolerate corruption, we must share our experience. When leading, you must acknowledge that everyone does things differently. During the conference, we saw a variety of ways used to tackle different issues. The association has no website, and the first thing we're going to do is establish one where information can be shared. Another pressing matter is establishing a long-term st strategic plan, but most especially one for the time we'll be heading the association. We will also organize training for institutions and not just those charged with corruption, but all of them, starting with those that deal with corruption matters, but also those that handle public and private funds, things like banks. We must also champion the formation of anti-corruption committees in the institutions of African countries that are part of the Commonwealth, and we believe the initiative will yield results. Now, 
The political will exists and that is essential. The participating countries commended Rwanda's efforts in fighting corruption and all countries also showed what they're doing to this end. It was also emphasized that communities need to be involved in the fight against corruption and as Rwanda shared our experience on the use of technology in fighting corruption, how it is used in the court system, public tenders and auctions. We therefore agreed that all member states will boost the use of technology in this way. There is also the matter of leaders disclosing how they accumulated their wealth, the laws governing the process and how they are enforced. And to other matters, during celebrations to mark the World Day for Safety and Health at Work, employees of Funda Tea Factory requested the Ministry of Public Service and Labor to resolve various issues including a favoritism in the workplace, working without contracts and health insurance for employees and their families. We have the report with Precious Chilezi. The employees of the Funda Tea Factory are of the view that there is favoritism in the workplace, evident in the way some employees receive higher salaries than they're supposed to and health insurance while others are left behind. The reason I say there is favoritism in the workplace is because those that have a similar contract as my own were provided with the Medipla health insurance while I am stuck with Mitual de Sante. Some employers are getting bonuses for doing the same work we do and that is unfair. Others are bothered by the fact that they are working without contracts, which is a disadvantage that their representative Nizeima Nafostin vividly depicts. We wish the ministry could help us initiate civil engagements between employers and employees to ease problem resolution and give a voice to employees with their employers. These problems were pointed out when Rwanda celebrated World Day for Occupational Safety. The factory's administration did not comment on these underlying issues. However, the Minister of Public Service and Labour had something to say about this. This is an internal problem which we have just been made aware of. Now that it has been put out in the open, the problem will be resolved. Some of them are treated like day laborers despite having been there for a couple of years and that needs to be corrected. The minister emphasized that they have always encouraged employers to have discussions with their employees with the intention to address their problems and resolve them in an ethical manner. This helps workers feel secure in their jobs and that is reflected in their efficient productivity. All right, now dermatologists are sounding an alarm. They've pointed out that the use of skin bleaching products such as lotions and medicines have negative side effects that can be harmful to a person's health. And they include chronic illnesses as well as other serious psychological problems because they enslave. Now, Olive Ntete brings us more. The skin is the largest organ of the human body and it plays an important role in protecting the body from wastes and other various factors that can damage the internal organs of the body. The skin has different colors depending on the race, but some people use different products such as lotion and medicines to change the color of their skin, also called skin bleaching. Some residents express their views on this matter. Using different body lotion in order to change your skin, uh, you can make your skin become dehydrated or it can be destroyed a lot. They have to be proud of how they are. If you are an African, if you are black, keep being black. Black is beautiful. Uh, instead of using a lot of lotion or many lotion in order to be brown like others you see like uh, superstars or you can be looking beautiful without changing your skin color, without using a lot of things just keep looking like that how you are how you are black how you are looking you are you look very beautiful with your black skin dr uwajeni amani alice a dermatologist at the university teaching hospital Sashuika, notes that using skin bleaching products have adverse effects on human health including psychological problems side effect of uh, skin bleaching products 
there are so many there are local side effects meaning where you apply them you can get discoloration you can get blue gray color which will not look really fair you can get skin irritation you can also have a high risk of skin cancer you also get a risk to be infected more than people who are not using skin bleaching product and also people using skin bleaching product containing mercury it can make an injury to their kidneys can make the injury to their nerves can also cause uh, depression can end up causing also uh, psychosis a type of mental disease which is somehow avoidable if you avoid to use them again people using hydroquinone this hydroquinone also can lead to to discoloration skin irritation also reduce the skin capability to avoid against skin cancer so if sun is burning you more and more you get a high risk to get skin cancers like squamous cell carcinoma which are really a disease which can cause death to those who are abusing those products in the recent Congress of the RPF in Otani, the President of the Republic, Paul Kagame, mentioned about importation of skin bleaching products. People who burn their skin just to look like white people. It is dangerous and unhealthy. I usually read about it and it shows that it causes serious diseases to people. And you find that it's the only thing they are doing, as if they are doing something important like bringing soap or milk for the children. But that actually shows that there are customers in the country. And you see that someone's priority is skin bleaching. Some people are unfortunate while trying to lighten their skin. They end up turning yellow or even green. And you find that someone ends up looking like a rainbow using these products. Is that RPF too? Really? Efforts and money used in such activities can assist us solve other issues. And I am also referring even people as individuals. This problem of skin bleaching is among the causes of various chronic illnesses such as skin cancer, kidney diseases and so many other various diseases and it also negatively affects people's development because the skin bleaching products are very expensive. Olive Nete, RTV News. You had it right now do what's right with you. Now as we move ahead, different environmental protection agencies say that Rwanda has already made great strides in environmental protection because of the strict uh, rules that has been uh, established and uh, put in place, even though there is still a long way to go. We don't have the details. The Minister of Environment has shined a light on the fact that there are still human activities that are polluting the environment while attending a joint meeting, bringing together various environmental stakeholders in Kigali. The objective is to examine Rwanda's progress in formulating policies, laws, and different environmental protection projects to ensure Rwanda's success at the Stockholm meeting in Sweden. The conference will be attended by different countries in the first week of June this year. The conference will focus on the environment and humanity. We can surely say that in 20 years, we have achieved a lot, we have achieved, uh, we have put up policies, uh, programs, projects, and we have implemented those projects, but it is not enough. I can say that we have achieved a lot, but we still have a long way to go, especially in the soil erosion control, in the protection of buffer zones, of rivers and lakes. And of course, we have to make sure that we cover at least 30.5% of our land by forest. We have to protect our forest. We have to sequestrate more carbon from the air. We have to make sure that we breathe the clean air, and we have to make sure that each and every Rwandan plays his role or her role in protecting the environment, in protecting the Rwanda we want. We will achieve the Rwanda we want with the contribution of each and every one. 
Some of the notable achievements in environmental protection include various programs that have been implemented, such as the implementation policy, the environmental policy, the plastic bags policy of 2008, and the policy on disposal of disposable materials, all of which came in addition to the Forest Service and the Environmental Protection Act. The head of department at Rwanda Mines Petroleum and Gas Board says that there are still environmental effects from the history of mining in Rwanda. So challenges are also there because mining um, in Rwanda began since 1930s during the colonialism. So uh, we have what I, I can call environmental degradation legacies. So you find in some districts like in Ngororero, uh, Wamagana, uh, Mohanga, you find very, uh, very serious degradation, environmental degradation uh, cases. So these ones, they were left behind by the, 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 the Belgians. Uh, as we speak now, it's a very big challenge because it requires a lot of money, enough budget to rehabilitate and uh, uh, but uh, the government now is aware of the issue, so we are trying to see if we can collect the money and uh, start rehabilitation. Uh, but uh, not only those uh, that were left behind by the Belgians, but we also have other recent ones. Uh, because of the topography of our country, uh, mining is still a challenge, but uh, with the uh, mechanism that we have put in place, we are now trying to see how we can uh, fix those changes progressively. Um, uh, we have uh, put in the law a requirement that uh, every mining company or acquiring company should have an environmental guarantee fund, which will be used uh, when the mining license holder is not able to fix or to rehabilitate the way he has mined. So with all those mechanisms in place, we hope that uh, the challenges will be addressed. Maxwell Gomera, the representative of the United Nations Development Programme in Rwanda, commended Rwanda for its progress in environmental protection. We measure progress on account of how our GDP is growing, how our income, gross domestic product is growing. But that is misleading. Because if you measure progress that way, you are also not taking into account the damage that we are doing on environment. So just to give you an example, if I go and cut down all the trees in Musanze and sell them, our GDP will go up. But what does it do to the farmers who rely on those trees? What does it do to the soils? Everybody loses. And that is not taken into account. Now Rwanda is at the forefront of changing that. An international environmental conference is scheduled to be held in Stockholm, Sweden, next month where Rwanda will have the highest levels of environmental visibility. The meeting will focus on behavior influences, barriers, and what needs to be done. And that's where we leave it tonight, folks. Thanks for your company. We've loved bringing you the latest here in Rwanda and around the world. I'm Isabel Masozera. And my name is Sam Kalisa. Keep it RTV. Good night. Bye.